come to you today, we desire more than anything else, not only to hear your word, but to, to allow it to sink deep into our hearts. And for there, it to take root and to bear precious fruit, Lord. We live in a very, very crazy world. A world that seems to be spiraling downward all around us. And yet when we come to your word, you give us hope. You give us hope that this world is but for a while. And there is a world to come that is for eternity. And that if we will put our trust in you, that one day we will be there with you. We look forward to that day, but until then, Lord, we pray that we would be found faithful, that we would persevere, that we would be the people you have called us to be in this world. And now, Lord, may the words of our mouths and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as you're being seated. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. We continue our study herein. This is the message to the church at Sardis. We're in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1 through verse 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Founded in 1200 B.C., Sardis had a rich and exciting history. In the 7th century B.C., it was the capital of the Lydian Empire. Its king, Jesus, established the city's wealth and power beyond anything that had been previously known. It was the first city ever to mint gold or silver coins. Think about that. The Pactolus River, which ran through its city's edge, was known for gold dust. Sardis was a very wealthy city. In fact, Jesus' son, Croesus, whose wealth was legendary, became prideful and overconfident in his power and decided that he would attack the Persian king Cyrus. And when Croesus failed to conquer Persia, Cyrus retaliated and besieged the city of Sardis. For centuries, Sardis had been impregnable. Its citadel sat high atop a precipice which was inaccessible on three sides and accessible from only one side. The other three were protected by 1,500-foot sheer cliffs. So confident were the Lydians that these cliffs could not be scales, they did not even bother to post guards to protect them. One of Cyrus's men scaled a crevice in this supposedly unscalable cliff and opened the gates. And after 14 days of siege, the city fell in 450, uh, 546 B.C. This so astonished the Greek world that the term capturing Sardis became a saying for achieving the impossible. Twice more in the history of Sardis, this feat would be repeated by the beginning of the first century. Sardis was among those cities whose glory had faded. Then in 17 AD, a terrible earthquake destroyed the city, and the emperor Tiberius gave the city millions of, well, the equivalent of millions of dollars, and five-year exemption from taxes to enable them to rebuild. And by the time of John's revelation, at the end of the first century, Sardis was once again very prosperous, a city full of industry and trade. While it never gained, regained its former 
glory, it was still doing quite well. In the city was a temple to the pagan goddess Sibyl, a temple that had never been finished. Sibyl was fabled to be able to bring the dead back to life. Thus there was this cultural fascination with resurrecting the dead in Sardis. And there was a large Jewish community here in Sardis, which dated back to the 4th century B.C. Historians tell us that many of those Jews that were in Sardis were also Roman citizens and enjoyed the benefits of Roman citizenship. Josephus, the historian, tells us that it was a very large and wealthy Jewish community that dwelt there. In fact, one of the largest synagogues ever excavated by archaeologists was built there in the second century A.D. Interestingly, though, it was part of a gymnasium complex. Now, you want to know why that's interesting? Well, because historically the Jews wanted nothing to do with the Greco-Roman gymnasiums because in those gymnasiums people exercised in the nude, which exemplified the pagan sensuality of the day. And what this tells us is that the Jews in Sardis had become so comfortable with their pagan neighbors that they had begun to adopt their ways. From the content of Christ's letter to the church at Sardis, it would appear that the Christians had also compromised. They had accommodated the culture instead of confronting it with the gospel and the life changes that the gospel necessitates. All of these things, their sense of impregnability, their prosperity, their former glory, their accommodation of the culture, their pagan fascination with resurrection of the dead, play prominently into the message that Jesus has for this church. It's very interesting how Jesus understands his audience because he knows their hearts. He knows how to communicate to them at the very point where they understand the best. The text is out, laid out like this. It begins with a salutation, a greeting to the angel or the pastor, or the messenger, of the church at Sardis. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. The seven spirits of God speak to the completeness of the Holy Spirit of God. Seven being the number of completion. The stars, again, as we know from chapter 1, verse 20, are the messengers or pastors to the seven churches. Jesus wants the people in Sardis to understand that it is he who holds them, it is not they who hold him. This is a very clear and important distinction for us to understand. He is the master, they are the servants. What becomes evident is that the members of the church at Sardis had compromised the gospel, making it something it was never intended to be. And Jesus wants them to know that neither he nor the gospel is open for redefinition. He will not be controlled. If there was ever a message for the contemporary church, as it twists the scripture in an effort to be cool and accepted by the culture it is here, people today may want to amend the gospel. They may put a spin on it and try to make it something that it was never intended to be. And they may try to portray Jesus in a way that the culture finds appealing. There's no better example than this He Gets Us ad during the Super Bowl. It's just a twisting of Scripture to accommodate the culture. I, I thought it was interesting that they had all these people wash. Listen, Jesus washed His disciples' feet. It was the prostitute that washed Jesus' feet. This, this, this twisting of the Scripture to make it something that has no bite to it, that has no sting, that has no offense. It's very common in our culture, but it goes all the way back to the first century. There's always been that effort to take away the offense of the gospel. But the Bible says that the gospel is a stumbling block that it's offensive to lost people. And if we ever preach a gospel that is not offensive, it's not the gospel. Because the gospel tells us that we are sinners and that in and of ourselves, if left to our own devices, if we would be honest with ourselves, we will head to hell. And we deserve it. The gospel says we cannot ex. We cannot extricate ourselves from our sin. We can't get rid of it. We cannot expiate our sins. 
Only the blood of Christ can do that. It tells us that we are hopeless and helpless and that we must cast ourselves upon the mercy of God. That's not a message that is popular, folks. Our text reminds us that if we are in relationship with God, He defines the terms. He holds us. We don't hold Him. The gospel is His message. It's been entrusted to us, the church, His bride. It is so that we can take His message to the nations, not so that we can change His message so the nations will accept it. Jesus quickly moves from His salutation to a word of rebuke or condemnation. The unique thing about this particular letter among all seven is that there is no word of commendation. There's nothing which Jesus tells them that they are doing well or for which they can be praised. This is the only church among the seven that receives such a scathing rebuke. And and as I was preparing the message, especially after last week's, I'm like, whoa, this is going to be fun. I mean, Ephesus had its toil and its perseverance. It wouldn't put up with false doctrine. Smyrna was rich in God's eyes despite its material poverty. Pergamum, for all their problems, held fast to the name of Jesus and would not deny his faith. And Thyatira, corrupt as it was, still had love, faith, and perseverance. But there are no words for the saints at Sardis. No words of approval. No commendation, only condemnation. Speaking words that no Christian wants to hear, our Lord tells them that although they have a reputation for being alive, they are in fact dead. Now, some of you may not know this, but in East Texas, there's a town called Deadwood. And there's a First Baptist Church, Deadwood. I think that name, that appellation, belongs to a lot more churches than are found in Deadwood, Texas. In fact, I've heard of churches so dead, somebody had a heart attack, they cleaned out ten rows before they found the right one. (laughs) There's a lot of dead churches today, folks. The Sardinians had a reputation among the churches of Asia. If you'd gone to Ephesus or Thyatira and you'd ask about Sardis, they would have said, man, things are going great there. Haven't you heard? That is a very wealthy church. They have got their act together. You should see their Christmas pageant. If there had been Christian publications back then, they probably would have been profiled as a progressive example of how to reach your culture and how to be, how to be relevant. The problem was while they had a reputation for being alive, they were in fact deader than a doornail. Their reputation no longer reflected their reality. What they were doing no longer had God's anointing on it. There was no movement of God's Spirit in their midst. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. All I can say to that is, ouch. That's a very painful word from the Lord. It's one thing for us to have a name among humans. It's an entirely different thing for God to know the true nature of our spiritual condition. Like so many churches today, the church at Sardis was living on a reputation of days gone by. I can take you to a thousand churches or more that are huge sanctuaries, beautiful multi-million dollar buildings, and they're absolutely empty, and they're crumbling And the people that used to go to the church have all died. And the people that still go to the church drive for 20 minutes to come to it because they are so married to the past and to their legacy that they're no longer concerned about what God is doing now and where God is working now. They are stuck in the past. I tell people that there's a reason your windshield is that wide and your rearview mirror is that big. Because you're supposed to be spending more time looking ahead than you are looking behind. That doesn't mean we should forget the past. As someone said, if we forget our past, we're destined to repeat it. 
But the past is a great guidepost, not a hitching post. They were living on their former glory, and in the midst of it, they were dead. I can't tell you the number of churches I've talked to, both while working as a denominational uh, servant and as a pastor, that are dead. They're just dead. And they don't care. Because they would rather the church be dead and them be in control than the church be alive and God be in control. Don't get me started. And what's more, it appears that they had compromise their beliefs and practices. I mean, there's no word here about persecution, no word about suffering for the sake of Christ. After all, if you go along to get along with the culture, the culture is not going to hate you. The culture is not going to respect you. They're simply going to neglect you. They don't care. It is, it is, it is this, folks. If you and I take a stand for Christ in our culture, the culture will hate us for it. If we speak truth that God created the earth and, and he created man and he created woman in his image and that we didn't come from monkeys, you speak that truth and the people in our culture will hate you for it. You speak the truth that there are only two genders. You speak the truth that homosexuality is not God's plan. You speak truth in our culture. You stand up for the unborn and say that an unborn child is a human being created in the image of God. You speak truth in our culture, and the culture will hate you for it. But if you avoid all those things, and you just tell the culture, we're going to hold hands and sing kumbaya, and we're just going to accept everybody as they are, and we're not going to offend anyone, then the culture no longer hates you. They do not respect you. They just neglect you. You are no longer relevant. And that is what happens in so many of our denominations and so many of our churches today that have ceased preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and have begun to preach a gospel of accommodation. So Jesus calls them to action. In verses 2 and 3, there are five imperatives or commands to the church. Commands that are not optional if the church wants to avoid the judgment of God. First, he says, wake up. Literally, be watchful. They've fallen asleep spiritually, and they need to wake up out of their lethargy and come to the realization of the reality of their spiritual condition. Staying awake spiritually is difficult. When the siren song of the culture around us beckons us to its slumbering pleasures and distractions, like the proverbial frog in the kettle, our demise rarely is sudden or abrupt, but rather gradual and seemingly peaceful. It is for this reason that the Word of God is a necessary part of the Christian life, folks. When we see life through the lens of the Word of God, we see things as they really are, not as the world would have us see them. The church at Sardis needed to wake up. They'd fallen asleep. Secondly, he says, strengthen that which remains. Literally, stand on its feet those things which remain, which, have, which are about to die. It appears the Christians at Sardis had at one time seen their need for spiritual renewal and revival, but they'd been sidetracked, derailed, diverted, their, their lives no longer demonstrated the faith they professed. They were lacking, and their deeds, their works were incomplete, pleasing to men but not pleasing to God. They had not finished what they had started, and Jesus is calling them back to strengthen what was left in their spiritual life, to put it back on track, to get back on their feet. Then there's a third imperative. Remember, remember what you had received and heard. This would have been... The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude 1.3 says. They knew the truth. They knew they should be alive. They knew that compromise with the world was unacceptable in God's eyes. But they had allowed other things to come between them and truth. And God is telling them to remember the things they had received and heard. And this call should not be lost on us. God has entrusted us with great spiritual knowledge, folks. And I don't care if every church around us, if every denomination around us compromises, God will hold us accountable for what we do. 
and we cannot take our marching orders from the world. We, we certainly don't take our marching orders from our denomination. We take our marching orders right here from the Word of God. Remember what you've received. Fourth, don't just be hearers of the Word. Be doers. Keep it. My Word. Jesus says in John 14, 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. He doesn't say just know my commandments. He doesn't say have my commandments on a postcard on your refrigerator. He doesn't say tattoo my commandments on your arm. He says, keep them, do them, put them to practice. And that brings us to the final imperative here. He says, repent. Repent means to turn around. It means you're headed in the wrong direction, and you need to stop and turn around and go in the right direction. One of the things which defines the spirit of the age is the spirit of lawlessness. No one wants to be restrained. No one wants anyone to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. Everyone, listen, wants to do what is right in their own eyes. Scripture warns of this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, Know this, though that in the last days there are troublesome times impending, for people will be self-lovers, avaricious, boasters, haughty, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, irreverent, without natural affection, relentless slanderers, uncontrolled, brutal, with no love for good, treacherous, rash, conceited, pleasure-loving rather than God-loving, while retaining a form of piety, they are strangers to its power. Turn away from this kind. Folks, if that doesn't describe what's going on today, nothing does. These folks who have a form of godliness but are strangers to its power are actually very religious You see, this religious, this rebellious attitude, you see it in our culture. It's exactly what it's made its way into our churches now and in individual lives. People don't want a pastor telling them, God says you can't do this. God says you're supposed to do that. People want a pastor to come along and tell them you can have your best life now. God's going to make you rich. He is a celestial genie. Rub the Bible and poof, out comes the genie and all your wishes come true. The problem with that is that's not Scripture. That's people gathering to themselves, teachers who will tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. The the world in which we live doesn't talk to them about repentance. The world in which we live doesn't call them to to be honest about their spiritual condition. The world in which we live, and the world in which we live to which many churches and many Christians have compromised, says be honest with yourself. That's just who you are. Embrace it. Embrace your fallen nature and just be true to yourself. Folks, you can be true to yourself all the way to hell. The gospel calls us to see ourselves for the sinners that we are and to repent. Jesus won't tolerate this nonsense in his church. Simply put, he loves us too much to allow us to continue in our self-deception. So he calls us to be alert, to strengthen what remains, to remember the rich heritage of truth that we've received and to obey it. If we fail to do so, judgment will come. Thus we find that we must wake up and acknowledge the reality of our spiritual condition. So Jesus goes on to give the consequences of disobedience and the rewards of obedience. He says, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at which hour I come. This message is repeated in chapter 16. Like the city of Sardis had been destroyed because her guards were not watching, so Jesus will come swiftly and bring destruction on a church unaware. The image of a thief in the night goes back to Matthew chapter 24. In the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. While this imagery is often used to refer to the second coming in this letter, Jesus is using it to speak about the judgment that will unexpectedly come on the church 
if they refused to wake up and repent. On the other hand, there were those in Sardis, a minority, mind you, a remnant that had not soiled their garments by accommodating the world. To them, Jesus says, they will walk with him in white for they are worthy. The white garments speak to both the victory and purity. Romans wore white to celebrate victory. In Revelation 4, 4, the elders seated around the throne are clothed in garments of white. In chapter 6, 11, those who had been slain because of the word of God are given a white robe. It speaks of purity. Jesus promises swift punishment for those who refuse to repent and victory for eternity for those who have not soiled their garments by compromise with the world. Now, there's a threefold promise here. Number one, those who, who do not compromise, those who hold true, those who persevere, those who overcome will be clothed in white. Their name will not be erased from the book of life, and Jesus will confess their names before his Father. All three are promises that speak of eternal life. The text closes with this call for those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So what is the Spirit saying to the church this morning? I'm glad you you ask. I mean, admittedly, it's a tough text, but God has given it to us for our good to help us conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, let me suggest several things as we seek to apply this to our lives. Number one, I believe our text speaks to the necessity of authentic spiritual evaluation. The unexamined life, said someone, is not worth living. So often we spend our time examining other people's lives and not examining our own lives. Jesus says, before you see the speck in your brother's eye, look for the log in your own. And so I think the first thing our text is calling us to is to take a look at ourselves to make sure we're not deceiving ourselves, to think we are something that we are not. While only the Holy Spirit can show us the true nature of our hearts, there are some searching questions that we can ask ourselves which will help us gain a clearer understanding of where we are spiritually. Let me just suggest five to you this morning, five questions to help you assess where you are spiritually. Number one, Is there evidence in my life of a genuine transformation? I mean, that is, is my life in Christ drastically and dramatically different than it was before I came to Christ? Now, I know many came to Christ at an early age, and there is no before time. I mean, when you were three, you you know, you weren't going to the bars and drinking and everything. But the reality is, is there a a contrast between me and the rest of the world? Can this transformation be seen in my life as my life is set up against the rest of the world, the the lost culture around me? Are God's priorities my priorities? Am I burdened for the things that burden Him? Is there evidence that I've been changed? Can others see Jesus in my life? That's a tough question, but it's followed up by another one. Do I have a passionate love for Jesus that translates into authentic love for others? As I was preparing for this sermon, I got to tell you, you know, people think preachers just get up and say things. Well, I don't know. I I just don't. It's got to speak to me before it can speak through me. And the person that I'm toughest on as I prepare the scripture is myself. Because it it has to hit home here. I have to understand that it first applies to me. I can't preach if I'm not willing to practice. There's a reason Jesus calls us to love not only one another, but to love our enemies. See, it's not hard for me to love people who are lovable. Lovable people are easy. It's easy to love puppy dogs. Cats, not so much. Some people are puppy dogs. Some people are cats. You see, I I think if you have somebody who is unforgiving, who returns evil for evil instead of returning good for evil, you show me somebody who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen and claims to love God who he has not seen, I'll show you somebody that doesn't have the love of Jesus in them, folks. I didn't say what God calls us to do and be is easy. And I'm going to tell you we can't do it in our own strength. But genuine, authentic love 
is the mark, the authentic mark of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And that means that you forgive others for what they have done to you, even as Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus can forgive those who are crucified in him, what is it that someone's done to you that you can't forgive? And if you have died to yourself and Christ is living through you, is he not going to forgive them? Is he not going to love them? Do I have a passionate love for Jesus? It translates into authentic love for others. Question number three, is the word of God authoritative in my life? I mean, do I order my steps according to his word? You see, authentic believers are those who not only know what the scripture says, but who submit their lives, their will, their desires, their agenda, their entirety to what God tells us in his word. Somewhere along the way, we have equated knowledge with spirituality, but God doesn't see things that way. Knowing his word is useless if we don't put it into practice. You can know that you are supposed to exercise and eat healthy, but if you don't do it, that knowledge is of no use to you. Do you order your steps according to his word? Number four, do I walk in the spirit? Now, every Christian, everyone who's genuinely born again has the spirit of God living within them. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. That when he saves us, he seals us. He puts his stamp of ownership on us by putting his Holy Spirit in us. From that point forward, it's not how much of the Holy Spirit we get, but how much of us the Holy Spirit gets. How much of our lives are surrendered to him. Those who walk in the Spirit give evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Love, joy, peace, and even temper, kindness, goodness, fidelity, gentleness, self-control. These characterize their lives. These characters, these characteristics should be evident to others. And can I say something about the fruit of the Spirit, folks? You don't have to strain to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You don't have to get up in the morning. If you're filled with the Spirit of God and you're under His control, you don't have to get up and say, oh, I've got to be kind today. I've got to be loving today. Oh. I mean, you don't have to strain to produce the fruit of the Spirit any more than an apple tree has to strain to produce apples. Because you see, apple trees, by their very nature, produce apples. Apples just fall off the trees. That's because they're apple trees. Authentic believers who are filled with the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit just falls off of them because that's who they are. And you see, we don't have to do it. God will do it through us if we will simply surrender ourselves to His power and His presence in our life. That's the key to to, to living the Spirit-filled life dying to yourself and letting the Spirit of God come and live the life of Jesus through you. Question number five, is there evidence that I'm growing in my faith? Living things grow, dead things decay. It's just that simple. Which could you say of your spiritual life this morning? Are you becoming more like Jesus as time goes by? Or like the church of Sardis, was there a day when you were more passionate about him, more in love with him, more concerned about the things that concern him than you are today? You see, knowing the answer to these questions helps you understand where you are on your spiritual journey. Now, but not only does our text speak about the necessity of being honest about our spiritual condition, it also calls us to remember our role as Christians in this world. The church at Sardis was obviously more concerned with what the world thought about them than what God knew about them. I hear so many people in our culture saying, well, and in, in churches, pastors, well, the world is watching. Listen, I don't care if the world is watching. I'm more concerned that God is watching. 
I'm more concerned with what God knows than with what the world thinks. The world doesn't know my heart. The world's not going to sit on the throne. God knows my heart. God knows every secret of my mind and my heart. I need to be more concerned about what God knows than what the world thinks. And here's why. Because I've not been put on this world to fit in. I've been put on this world to be an ambassador for Christ. I've been put on this world to be light in the darkness, to be salt amongst the decay. And I have a responsibility to my Father in heaven to be who He has made me to be. We see how applicable this is in our culture. It seems the culture is dictating talking points for many churches today. Instead of speaking into the culture from the Word of God, the culture is speaking into the church. And the church, instead of listening to the Word of God, is listening to the culture. This text is a great reminder that God's not concerned with what the culture has to say. I was listening on my walk this week I was listening, I listened to the whole book of Ecclesiastes. It's just fun to listen to a whole book at one time. And he says over and over again, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. Everything that is has been. Everything that's going to be is or has been. The culture today with all its technology and all of its supposed innovation is at its root no different than it was 2,000 years ago. The heart of man is still desperately wicked and deceitful above all things and is still in need of the gospel. We are called to remember that Christ has put us here to faithfully represent him to a lost and dying world. Number three, there's a word here about perseverance. Now, some of you have been waiting for this the whole sermon. One of the promises made to those who overcome is that their name will not be erased from the book of life. I can't tell you how many well-intended, really sweet people have come up to me and said, see there, the Bible says your name can be erased from the book of life. Well, pardon me, that's not what it says. This is a promise, not a threat. It's a promise that's sandwiched between two other promises. In the Greek language, it's a double negative used to express a positive. It's kind of like a mother saying to her child, I will never stop loving you. That's not a threat that I'm going to stop loving you if you're disobedient. No, it's a promise that no matter what you do, I will never stop loving you. That's what this means. But at the same time, this text is a great reminder that we must be very serious and intentional about what it is saying about salvation. You see, the necessity of persevering in the faith is something the Scripture treats with great solemnity, and so should we. In our attempt to make things simple, I'm afraid we have oversimplified things. I can't tell you how many well-intended preachers I've heard say, once saved, always saved. Well, that is distilling a truth down to a point almost of being absurd because it doesn't explain what it means. Craig Keener, in his book on Revelation, comments on this with more balance and grace than any other commentator I've read. Keener says, The explicit warning of verse 5, that those who do not overcome will be blotted out from the book of life, challenges some popular ideas in traditional North American religion. Armenians teach that apostasy can reverse the results of conversion and that you can lose your salvation. Historic Calvinist or Reformed people teach that people who fail to persevere were never saved to begin with. But what is most important is that both agree on the end result. Those who do not persevere are lost. But many, especially in my own Baptist tradition, says Keener, have wrongly reinterpreted the Calvinist teaching so as to allow into heaven anyone who once professed salvation, an idea refuted both here and regularly throughout the New Testament. 
This biblical scholar says, In personal evangelism, I have often encountered nominal evangelicals who rarely give thought to the Lord Jesus Christ, yet suppose that they are bound for heaven because they once were baptized or followed someone in the sinner's prayer. The promise that those who persevere will not be blotted out from the book of life also offers a serious warning to many nominal Christians in our culture, in our culture who depend purely on a past profession of faith to ensure their salvation. In other words, a Christian is not someone who walked the aisle, said a prayer, and got baptized. A Christian is not someone whose name is on the church roll and got a letter from the pastor saying, I'm so glad you made a decision for Christ. A Christian, listen to me, is someone who's been transformed by the power of God, who is continuing to be transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ all the days of their life, a person in whose life the process of sanctification never completely stops. That doesn't mean they don't stumble. That doesn't mean there aren't times of lapse, but they never completely stall. That's what our forefathers meant when they talked about the perseverance of the saint. They didn't mean that once you said a prayer, you had a fire insurance policy from hell. They meant that if the Spirit of God truly transforms you, you will, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the pressure from the world, in spite of what anyone else may say or do, you will continue to persevere and you will hold on till the end. The day of rapture is going to be a sad day for many church members. I'm just going to tell you, if the rapture happens on a Saturday night, there's going to be a lot of people show up to church on Sunday morning. Because Jesus says this, doesn't he? In Matthew 7, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, in your name did many wonderful works. These are leaders in the Christian movement. And I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. What a sad, sad thing to know that they will not realize their mistake until it is too late. This text, folks, calls us to examine where we are and to persevere, to stay strong in the faith. You don't think I live in the same world you do? You don't think I get discouraged sometimes? Of course we do. Here's the thing. This book was written to encourage us. (laughs) This book was written to assure us that this stinking world isn't all there is. There's a world to come, and it is superior in every way to the world in which we live. There's a final thing I think our text tells us. Note with me. It speaks to the necessity of a fresh movement of the Spirit of God. I mean, the church was dead. Some of its members were hanging on by a thread. Spiritually speaking, they had one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. They could barely fog a spiritual mirror. They needed a fresh breath of God's Spirit to enliven them and to breathe back into them so they could once again feel the strength and the power and the flow that can only come from the Spirit of God. And folks, that is what we need. Each of us in our life, we need it. We need it in our churches. We need the Holy Spirit to awaken us from our lethargy, to to pull us from all of the, the temporal, material distractions that consume us. And we need to come back to an understanding of what things really are, to a spiritual perception. We need the power and the presence of the Spirit of God like never before. Churches across history have sought to do things, the things of God without the power of God, and those things have no lasting power. If we would make a difference for the kingdom of God here in Las Vegas, 
It will not be because we are richer, more clever, wiser, or because we work harder than the next church. That has nothing to do with it. Yes, we've been called to be good stewards. Yes, we've been called to to seek knowledge and, and to be wise in the way that we exercise the gifts and the talents that God has given us. But listen to me. The Bible says it's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. And what we need, folks, what I need, what you need, is a fresh movement of the Spirit of God to spark the fires of revival and awaken the church once again. That's what we need. God wants to do great things in this valley. I I have often contemplated why at my age he brought me here. I know many men who when they reach 60 years of age decide they're going to retire. And then they just go die somewhere. I don't see that in Scripture, folks. But at the age of 62, the tender young age of 62... God called me to Sin City. He didn't call me to the buckle of the Bible belt in Dallas, Texas. He called me to the desert, to a city that Satan thinks he owns. And he didn't call me here so that I could go out to pasture, because there ain't no grass here. He called me here because he wants to do something that only he can do. Next week, we're going to talk about the church at Philadelphia, the church that has an open door that no man can close. That's us. God is looking for a church. He's looking for people who will surrender themselves to Him, to His power, to His Spirit. He is looking for people who are wanting to experience a movement of the Spirit of God like nothing they have ever experienced before in their life. The question is, will we be those people? Will we be that church? Will we do what is necessary for God to move amongst us? Let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Pray with me, Father, this morning. What a word. I'm excited, Lord, about what you want to do here. And I just, I just want to start by saying, Lord, that you take me. I'll just surrender everything. And, and I know that when I give myself to you, you're not getting much. But I'm willing to do whatever you want, Lord. And I I pray that each of us would have that attitude. I pray each of us, Lord, would have that desire to commit ourselves wholly and unreservedly to you, holding nothing back, so that we might sense a movement of your Spirit among us, so that we might experience, Lord, the fire from heaven. And as a result, see men and women, boys and girls saved. See backslidden Christians get right with God. See the church explode. That is our desire. That is our prayer, Lord. There may be somebody here that doesn't know you. There may be Christians here, Lord, that need to get things right with you. I don't know. Only you know. But during this time of response, Lord, I pray you would move. We would respond. In Jesus' name.